It's a little bit more stable than using the bipod or the bags I've found. It's pretty good. Uh, still a little bit rocky, you know, because the, the actual, yeah, it's only cheapy. But um, yeah, I'll do a bit of modifications to it to make it a little bit more stable. But uh, yeah, that's for later. Now, why I'm doing this video is because I want to do, do a little bit of an update as to what's happened with this rifle. Now I said that I wasn't going to do another video until I got the new stock and rah rah rah. The stock was going to take three months originally, that's what I was told. Now whether they just said that to, you know, not, uh, you know, not disappoint me if it did take, you know, a few weeks, but um, it, it's on its way. It'll be here on, in how many days? In about a week. So yeah, can't wait for that. Now in the meantime, what I wanted to do, because those, uh, Previously, if you watched my previous videos, hopefully you have. Otherwise, you're going to be coming in midway and not know what the hell's going on. Um, I, I developed a few loads going from uh, 8.7 grains up to 9.4 grains, and because I, I the the primer strike was still crated, so I, I wanted to develop a few lighter loads and, and see how the, and just shoot my way up loads just to see how those primers looked. Um, it would seem that this rifle, uh, it just craters the primers because at 8.7 grains, that's, that is not, you know, a hot load at all. It's, well, it's not even a warm load. So it just craters the primers. There, there was no difference between 8.7 and 9.4 grains. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to 9.5 grains. Um, I've got a heap of extra, a heap of new um, brass and, uh, I'm going to make some, yeah, I'm going to go back to 9.5 grains. Anyway, one of the things that I wanted to talk about was, uh, again, the trigger on this thing. It's just, uh, it's, it's an absolute piece of garbage, like really, you know, and I, I'm probably going to cop a heap of flack from the Savage, you know, fanboys and that, but uh, Savage, is, that trigger is just rubbish, all right? It, it's a rimfire trigger. That's what it is. And why I say that is because to remove the bolt, you've got to pull the trigger. Because the only thing that's stopping the bolt from coming out is the sear, okay? That is the only thing that's stopping the bolt from coming out. When you pull the trigger, the bolt goes in. That stop is the actual sear holding the bolt from going out, which is a typical rimfire thing. A lot of rimfire rifles have uh, you, you got to pull the trigger to release the bolt because the sear is the bolt stop. Um, now that's problematic because you can only go so far, or you can only go, you can only reduce the weight of the trigger so much because it gets to a point where the sear does not stop the bolt from from pulling out. Now. What I've found the hard way is that I had to pretty much crank it back up and I've got the new, this is the new uh, Trigger Basics trigger piece, shoe, yeah, assembly. Now, it, it basically hasn't done anything because if you go, when I wound that spring out, originally when I got the rifle and I didn't have the adjustment tool, but it's just, it's just you, just, you can just stick a screwdriver in there and just twist it with a flat tip screwdriver to twist the spring. Because the spring, the, the thread in the in the trigger is actually, is the same as the spring. So you're actually twisting the spring out, screwing the spring out, um, or in. Now, when I, I only screwed that in a wee little bit. And when I was shooting it originally, now and then the bolt did come out on its own. The sear was not stopping it. And I didn't pay much attention to that until I got this new trigger with the new springs, lighter springs and everything. That spring that came with the Trigger Basics kit is so light that 
it didn't had no hope of 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 stopping the bolt from coming out. It was just coming out all the time. It was just uh, it was horrible. Anyway, what happened was so I put the I, using the Trigger Basics trigger, I put the old spring in it, and I got it down to two pounds and nine ounces, which is acceptable um, for precision shooting. But what happened was that, and when I was testing it out, I was I was cycling it, you know, and putting it on safe and no problems. You put it on fire, yep. Goes bang, no worries. Goes bang. And then I just kept doing that, right? No problems. That's oh beauty, I've got the I've got the trigger at 2.9 ounces. Well, at some stage I instead of just going, you know, gentle, gentle, I went and it went pop. And I went, hello, that sounded like the 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 uh, the firing pin releasing. The firing pins, you know, going bang, and uh, and I checked it out, and it and it was. What happens is that the trigger, in relation to the sear, there's a, there's like a little, tiny little step, right, where the where the trigger engages the sear and stops it from releasing the the firing pin spring. If you have that weight down, it doesn't engage it properly. It, it's just, just touching it, just touching it, and the slightest bit of movement, bang, it goes. And if you if you cycle it vigorously, once you um, maneuver that bolt handle down, like if you go, it, it would just bang, it would just release. So I had to crank the, um, the weight of it back up to where, pretty much, almost where it was. It's not quite where it was because I did cut a couple of coils off that spring. So it's very close back to where it was, really heavy. And I haven't bothered to weigh it because what's the point? I, there's nothing I can do about it. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sort of at a, at a loggerhead as to how to make this spring better because at the moment, it is really heavy and you know that's not good not good at all so I don't know I'm gonna to have to consult my uh, my gunsmith and say to him what can we do with this because at the moment uh, as far as I'm concerned it's not good enough but you know it is what it is so anyway also that that's that right now the Waltus the Waltus scope that I was talking about in another video. Um, I put it on. One of the problems with this, another, <laughs> yeah, another problem with this rifle is that the mounts that you get are so far apart that this scope, I can just, I was just able to, to fit it because um, it's just so far apart that it's almost hitting the bells, you know? It's just, so, but I do have a DNZ uh, one piece mount ring assembly coming, which will hopefully that will you know narrow that gap so you, you know, I can put on different scopes. Um, this scope, it functioned pretty, yeah, I didn't have a problem with it, it functioned well. Uh, it's pretty clear. Um, now, I'm not gonna keep this scope on here because the, the floating point, the dot in the center, well it's not a floating point, it's a crosshair with a dot. Um, it's just too chunky, like it's really chunky, even at, you know, I had it at 24 and it was just super chunky. So I'm not going to keep this scope on here. What I will do with this scope is put it on my uh, T-bolt. Yeah, because you know, you're not going to be shooting really beyond 100 meters with a 22 long rifle. So I'll put it on the T-bolt. And I'm not quite sure what scope I'm going to put on this. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I might buy another uh, Delta. And put it on. I'm really not sure. Uh, so that's the rifle and scope. And it, the scope's functions, yeah, pretty much fine. I did order another one 
funnily enough, I did order another one, and guess what? I paid for it, and then I got an email not long after, or a couple of days later, saying, oh, we've refunded you your, your payment because we can't send you the scope because there's a problem with the scope. Now, didn't say what the problem was, whether it's with, who knows what the problem is, I don't know. But it's functioned fine, so yeah. So if you want to buy one, you can't at the moment anyway. Now, one other thing I wanted to talk about, so this is a bit of a, a mixed bag video, is I've got another cold steel knife, yeah, and it's the Steve Austin Broken Skull. Now, I didn't get it because I'm a, because I'm a wrestling fan and a Steve Austin fan. I got it because uh, it, it's, all, all the reviews that I've read of it uh, were pretty, pretty good reviews, like pretty outstanding reviews. And um, so what you get is the, the box, you get, um, you get two belt clips because you can't put the same belt clip on the same side because it's sort of banana. But um, yeah, so the knife is, and you're thinking he's got pink. Well, I'd like to say that, yeah, yeah, I've got pink because, you know, if you drop it on the ground, it's easy to spot. But in actual fact, it's a complete mistake. Um, whether it was an error on my part or an error on Cleaver's, because I got it from Cleaver, firearms, um, I'm not sure who made the mistake, but I wanted AD green, you know, and I got pink, but it doesn't really bother me, you know, it's not like, <laughs> yeah, I'm wearing it around my neck, or that I care that it's pink, you know. So, yeah, it is what it is. So it comes with G10 scales, uh, it's got a belt clip. Now the belt clip, one thing about the belt clip, I don't know if you can see there's a gap there. Now that's an artificial gap. I made that gap. I just stretched it because when I first got it, that belt clip was so hard against the scale that I couldn't even put it in my pocket, I, you know, attached it by, by the belt clip. So, yeah. Now, what, the other reason that I've got this, it's because it's, it's a nice long blade. It's a four inch blade. So it's not a small knife at all, but it is extremely light because it, it has no spaces. No, it's just really thin G10 handles, but it, it, you know, it's, it feels great. And it's extremely, really, really, really light. Uh, what is it? Okay, what does it weigh? It weighs 3.1 ounces, which is really light for a four inch bladed knife. And I like this clip point, I really do. Some people don't. Uh, I'd rather have a drop point and all this. Ooh. And I, on some of the reviews, they're like, I think it was Cedric and Ada, Pete, he said, um, oh, you know, he'd rather have, you know, a, a drop point rather than the clip point. Well, they do make other knives very similar to it with a drop point, so, yeah, why'd you get that? Um, anyway, I like the clip point. And um, now, so it's got the triad lock, the classic Andrew Demko triad lock, which is really really strong what do they have hanging off at something like 350 or 390 pounds or something and it didn't come apart so yeah very strong um, another reason I got it is it's got, it's made from the carpenters CTS XHP steel which is a really really good steel um, Peter Cedric and Ada, if you haven't checked out Cedric and Ada outdoors check it out <clears throat> um, he does um, edge, pretty much edge retention tests on all, I think he's done it for just about every steel that there is. Yeah, so he, he's got a really good uh, channel. And um, I think he got something like 296 cuts. Of, he, he cuts sisal, or he calls it sisal, I call it sisal, you know, rope, fiber rope, natural fiber rope. And he got something like 296 cuts, I think, which is pretty good. So he was really impressed by it. And, and I am too, and I think you'll see the photo that you'll see is that the blade is almost dead center, you know? So it's not bad at all. It is dead center actually, yeah. It's dead center. Because I've seen on another review, his, his blade was like offset and it wasn't, yeah. But um, so, to, and it, when it came, it was quite stiff, but I've um, I put some graphite in the mechanism 
and now it's uh, a little bit looser. I don't want it too loose. Like, I don't have any problem opening it. You know, you can do the old, and that was, yeah, it's a bit wanky. Um, and just open it up. Yeah, so it opens up nicely. And um, it's a real cutter. Like, oh, what can I cut here? Yeah, here's some paper. Yeah, here's some copy paper. You know, yeah. I, um, oops, a bit ragged there. Yeah. The edge seems to be a little bit toothy, I think. I didn't mean to cut that up. Um, so, yeah, I really like it. I think it's a really nice knife. Um, now, for those people wondering, you know, how to, I've seen lots of different people displaying how they sharpen their knives. Now, as, as long as the profile of the edge is okay to and, and I when the when the blade gets dull, what I use is very lightly. A re, get yourself a really good steel, a really good knife steel. Okay, a professional. This is a professional knife steel, and there's a big difference between the cheapies and the professional ones. So I'll just lightly, just give it not many, just a few strokes. Then then I use this thing. No, not always, but some, a lot, most of the time. This is a flat steel. It's a very high carbon steel. It doesn't rust. Um, my father made this. He was a blacksmith, like a real blacksmith. Black, back when blacksmiths made, you know, cartwheels and, you know, they were the engineers of the day. And he's really from the old school, like really. So I inherited this so I'll that to take off the rough edges not a lot again just just the same story just and then finally this is what I use a knife strop this is just a small one uh, yeah and um, and I'll go open up it's uh, called a was it flexi flex cut flex cut carving knives knife knife strop which I got from um, a man's, it's called, there's, we've got a store here called Man's Toy Shop. It's a, yeah, it's a tool shop that carries everything that you can imagine for every industry. And I'll just run it like that, really lightly, just to take the rough edges off it. And um, so that's the final, that's the final thing. And then, you know, you get, yeah, it's, it's sharp. It's a bit rough. Yeah. yeah, it gets it really sharp. So that's how I sharpen. <clears throat> and, you know, the, it takes hair off, no problems. So yeah, really nice knife. And, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, my understanding is that Cold Steel and certain other manufacturers are having a hard time getting XHP, the Carpenter's XHP steel. So if you want to get this steel, I would advise you to get one because they're probably going to run out. They, they've gone over to, um, to what, I think, what steel, 30SV or something or rather, C Pam 30S, C 30SV or whatever. Yeah, because they can't get enough of, this, of the carpenter's steel, so get yourself one. So anyway, um, that pretty much covers everything I wanted to say on this episode. Um, I can't wait to get that stock and put this thing into that stock and yeah, see what happens then. Anyway, um, I'll keep you posted and I'll see you later.